All right. Well, thank you so much for those of you who are with us and punctual. It is 631 September the 28th, and we are here to talk about house hacking. Um, my name is Vic Kiros. I'm the branch manager of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, California Properties. And I have a longtime lender colleague of mine, Aaron Tennyson, also with us at the moment. Hi, Aaron. You want to give him your uh, background real quick? Yeah, hi, I'm Aaron Tennyson, uh, lending now. Been uh, doing this for the last 30 years and been working with Vic for the last, I don't know, what, 17, 18 years. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. This is about 05, I think. Yeah, for yeah. a long time. Um, and we've been working together uh, hand in hand. Um, you know, I don't get every deal that Aaron does, and he doesn't get every one that I do, but I know he's a reliable lender and he's uh, volunteered his time today to talk with us about how to utilize owner occupied financing to purchase real estate and essentially house hack it. So we're going to show you guys nine different ways where you uh, could potentially buy a piece of property, reduce your rent burden, and maybe even live free if you do it right. That's the yep. whole goal of this class, to talk with you guys about house hacking, okay? Um, it's not necessarily a, a technical term. It's something that, you know, the real estate industry calls, uh, you know, getting some income off your property to alleviate the burden of your mortgage payment, all right? So that's the discussion today. I um, also wanna uh, remind you guys that we do have a special promo going on for those of you who are on the live cast or those of you who are watching this recording, here's the promo. If you like this house hacking webinar and you think that, hey, you know what? In the next six, 12, or even 18 months, I think I'm gonna be able to do this. Then if you qualify, you contact Aaron Tennyson, he's our, our lender right here. If you contact Aaron Tennyson, you're gonna be able to quali well, contact him and get qualified for the next seven days, okay? If you get pre-qualified from today until next Wednesday, next Wednesday is October the 5th. If you yeah. get yourself pre-qualified by Aaron Tennyson for anything, like it doesn't matter if you qualify or you don't qualify, if you just go through the process of pre-qualifying yourself for a mortgage, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a $1,000 closing cost credit when you decide to buy a piece of property and utilize the house hacking tips and tools we're going to be showing you today. So that's a free $1,000 in closing cost credit that you don't have to come out of pocket for. Aaron and I are going to chip in. And the cool thing about this is, yes, you have to get yourself qualified or at least try to get yourself qualified in the next seven days. Like I said, October 5th, that's when this expires. So if you go through the process of pre-qualifying with Aaron before October 5th, we'll give you a $1,000 credit. And that $1,000 credit, is going to be good for not six months from now, not 12 months from now. I'm going to extend that out to 18 months because I know being in real estate for almost 20 years that buying a piece of property, especially when it's your first one, isn't something that happens overnight. It takes time sometimes to clean up your credit. Maybe you have to save up the down payment. Maybe you just move jobs and you need that job security and history behind you. So we're going to give you 18 months of credit. Okay. So here's the deal. One more time for those of you who just joined us. If you go through the pre-qualification process with Aaron in the next seven days, if you get pre-qualified or go through the process before October 5th, you will have 18 months to allow us to represent you on buying your first home to hack and we'll give you a thousand dollar credit. So you don't need to qualify now. You just need to go through the process and then make the purchase in 18 months or less and we'll give you a free thousand bucks. How does that sound? Free money, right? So we wanna help you take advantage of that. And um, with that said, let's go ahead and talk about house hacking. 
You guys are here to learn about house hacking and learn the nine different ways that you would be able to reduce your rent or possibly even live rent free. Mm -hmm. So first we got to talk about the advantages to home buying because there's a lot of people who don't understand the advantages mm -hmm. of being a homeowner. And we laid out a couple of things here for you. There's several advantages to buying a home. One of the most important things off the top is the ability to do what you please with the property when you please. Unless you're in an HOA, for the most part, you can do anything you want. You can knock a wall down, you can paint the rooms, you could change the decor, the flooring, the materials, you can redo the kitchen, you can do all the landscaping, you can do all kinds of cool stuff when you own a property versus renting. Yep, exactly. Another great advantage of owning real estate is the increase in equity. How many of you wish you would have bought more real estate in 2010 and 2011? Let me meet them. Point is. Probably, right? A whole lot of people. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, mute you guys who just joined. Hey, Bridget, thanks for joining us. So a lot of people wish they would have bought a lot more properties back in 2010-11. How many of you wish you bought more real estate in 2017 or even 2018 <laughs> before the pandemic hit, right? For the most part, real estate continues to go up because we know they're not making any more real estate. They're not making any more land. They're always building houses, but what we know right now is there's an inventory shortage which is pushing prices up. Even with these increases in interest rates, we're still seeing a high demand for quality listings. So let's make sure you understand that. Education <clears throat> is a great, great benefit to home ownership. The third advantage of owning a piece of real estate is you can deduct several things like property taxes and even interest paid on your mortgage on your tax return every year. So there's a lot of advantages to buying a house. And we know that, you know that, that's the reason why you're here. What we want to show you, though, is um, you know the, the basics of, of buying a house. You got to be aware of this stuff. First, you got to pick a location. You have to have the down payment ready and available. You got to make sure that you qualify based on the current interest rate and the lending points. You also have to have your closing costs. A lot of people get it confused that they only need their down payment, and that's not true. You need your down payment and your closing costs. When we combine those two numbers together, that's what we call your total cash to close. Then you're gonna go ahead and be okay with a monthly payment until you pay the property off. And remember, you're not a renter anymore, so you have to cover the maintenance on the house you purchase. These are all of the elements that are included when you decide to be a homeowner. So from there, when we're talking about the qualification process, and again, if you qualify with Aaron Tennyson in the next seven days, we're giving you a $1,000 closing cost credit good for the next 18 months. So get yourself qualified with Aaron before October 5th. We're giving you a $1,000 credit that's good for 18 months. You got to find out how much you can afford. And to do that, you want to talk to your friendly lender. Go ahead and run the numbers. How much down payment do you have based on your income and your expenses? How much do you actually qualify for? That's a big thing for a lot of people. So we got to figure that out. Now, let's talk about how house hacking can actually help you reduce the cost of home ownership, okay? This is the, the uh, steak and potatoes here, if you will, okay? This is the meat and potatoes of our presentation. How can house hacking help you reduce the cost of home ownership? Well, let's talk about it a little bit, okay? House hacking allows you to get started in real estate investing by using lower interest rates and a lower down payment because when you're house hacking, you're actually qualifying for owner-occupied financing. You see, there's a difference when you're buying the single-family residence house for what's called a primary residence for you to live in versus buying an investment property. There's a big difference in the financing. 
And we're going to give you some details in a little bit here, but I want to make sure you're aware that when you're buying a house for yourself, your own residence, you get a lower down payment and lower interest rate. When you're buying it purely as an investment property, there's a higher down payment and a way higher interest rate as well. So higher we closing want to sure costs and higher closing costs. Yeah, all of it, right, Aaron? It's all combined. So we want to make sure you're getting the lowest of the low when it comes to financing for your own owner-occupied property. That's part one of house hacking. Here's a great part of house hacking as well. People usually spend anywhere from 25% up to 50%, depending on the loan type, maybe even a little bit more, but usually 25% to 50% of their total income on their own housing. That's a lot of money, guys, okay? That's a lot of money. So what we're going to show you when you house hack, you're going to eliminate some of that mortgage burden by leveraging the property and actually being able to qualify, uh, leveraging the property and creating income every month. So, you know, mm -hmm. people get scared by the amount that they have to pay when they're buying a house. But when you're house hacking, you're leveraging the property and creating income, reducing your monthly burden. So that's a great, great benefit to house hacking. And when you see it played out, and we're going to give you a couple of case studies today, you're going to go, oh, wow, I didn't think I could afford that. But the way this works out, you can absolutely afford it. And potentially <laughs> even have your mortgage, your portion of the mortgage be less than what you're currently renting. Oh, yeah. And we're going to try to show them that, right? We're going to try to show them how to make some cash flow off of it. Something else we got here, we're going to show you how to reduce your debt to income ratio when you're house hacking. That's going to allow you as a real estate investor and a homeowner to easily qualify for your next investment property. And then guess what? Your next investment property after that. And then one more time, another one and another one. And eventually it snowballs. And if you house hack correctly, you could become a landlord that lives completely rent-free. And that's the goal for a lot of real estate investors. And it all starts with house hacking. It all starts with house hacking. We're going to show you how to do that today. So I just want to remind you, I have a couple of chats here, direct chats. Uh, we're going to save the Q&A for the very end. Okay, guys, we're going to do that at the end, but we're going to keep pushing here. Uh, keep those questions live. We'll go ahead and get to it in a second. So let's talk about the different types of home ownership that we have. Um, well, you have single family residents, of course, okay. multi-family homes, and condominiums. Okay? Those are the types of properties you're able to leverage when you're going to be house hacking. So let's talk first about multi-family house hacking. When we say multi-family, guys, we're talking two unit properties, three unit properties, or four unit properties. In the state of California, five units or more is considered a commercial real estate. It's not considered residential, even though you would be living in it. It's, it's residential, but framed as a commercial product. <clears throat> Multi-family house hacking options, okay? And we're going to give you some case studies right after this. But here are the two options you have to leverage multifamily properties. Number one, you could use a multifamily residence, a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, and put long-term renters in the secondary, tertiary, or fourth units to help offset your mortgage burden. That's traditionally the way most people would go. You could also buy a multifamily property and house hack it using vacation renters. Now we're talking about like buying in Palm Springs, buying in Big Bear, someplace where, you know, people come and stay for months at a time. I, I recently got back from uh, Martha's Vineyard and Martha's Vineyard is a vacation rental region. So they legitimately shut down in October and the city and town, there's some people who live there, but 80% of all their commercial businesses, all their restaurants, all of their stores, things like that, 
they shut down for the winter and they reopen in April. That is a vacation destination. And if you're looking for something like that in California, Palm Springs, maybe the mountains, something along the coast might work for you. But typically here in Southern California, if you're gonna be using multifamily property to house hack, you're gonna be using option number one, multifamily house hacking with long-term renters. So we actually have a case study that took place and we were able to close this transaction. And this buyer did exactly that. Bought a three unit property and was able to leverage this and make some good money off of it, okay? So um, we actually have an appraisal report to show you. I'm gonna exit out of PowerPoint very quickly because the appraisal report was so small when we threw it in the PowerPoint slide. I wanted to make sure you got a good view of it, okay? So let me go ahead and get out of here for just a moment and let's pull up that appraisal report here. All right, here we are. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Aaron here so he can explain uh, some of the key points on this appraisal because I, I think it's really important you guys understand how this works. So Aaron, we got the appraisal in front of us. How would you break this down? All right, so this is what they call a, a transmittal summary. It basically breaks down the, you know, the, the purchase, the property being purchased, uh, the borrower's income, uh, the type of loan. Uh, they can't see my mouse, can they? No, sir. No? Okay. So in this particular case, they did an FHA loan. Uh, they bought a property on Normandy Avenue in Los Angeles for $830,000. Uh, this particular one is a triplex, so three unit. Uh, air scroll down a bit. And so you can see under note information, they had to come in with a slightly larger down than your typical three and a half percent. And I'll explain that on the next piece and why. Um, but under stable monthly income, this was the borrower's monthly income. With this, and you know, on the next page or the next uh, slide, you'll see, or the next uh, breakdown I did, you'll see this particular gentleman could have bought a house for about 645,000. Using the additional rental income from the uh, other two units, he was able to purchase this $830,000 uh, $830, triplex. Um, yeah, if you scroll down, see, oh, I'm moving my mouth, like you can see it. Uh, so what we do is we utilize two of the three units and what the appraiser came in with was $2,400 per month market rent. Uh, from a loan standpoint, they allow us to use 75% uh, of, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, they allow us to use 75% of that towards your income to qualify for this home. Uh, so if you go to the next, the, the three unit, the breakdown, the payment breakdown, Vic, it'll be, uh, and see, and this is breaks down, the appraiser goes in and breaks down everything for the lender as far as the, the cost, the gross annual rental income. And that's for all three units, which of course you're living in one of them. So we can only use two. Now, if you move out in a year or two years or whatever down the road, well, now you can use all three units as rental income. So you can bypass this. This is just a piece of the appraisal. And we closed this back in August. This is a live deal that we closed in Los Angeles. And we're gonna go back to our PowerPoint now. Is that correct? The breakdown, all right. Oh, yes, yes. All right, so let me close this out this here. I can show you where, where this comes in handy. That, that just kind of shows you the deal itself. All right, so this is what I was explaining. So this same, this same borrower, and this is based on his income and all of that, this same borrower could have purchased a single family residence with no rental income for about $645,000. His, his total payment is about 4,257 bucks is what he'd be coughing up every month. 
utilizing the projected rental income of 4,800, and then they do subtract out 25%, and they take that out for maintenance and vacancy. Uh, they're assuming that you know you're going to have 25% of your rental income uh, lost due to maintenance and vacancy. Obviously, that changes if you get long-term renters that stay for a long time and pay you on time. Then hey, everything's good. But using that, that's how he was able to purchase the three units for the $830,000. Where the house hacking comes in is where I break it down here. Uh, rental income on the, on the remaining two units, he's not occupying total $4,800. Factor in the 25% vacancy factor and the expense factor, it leaves you about $3,600 a month in total rental income. Well, his current, from the previous slide, his current payment is $5,400. Subtract out 3,600. That means his piece of the mortgage payment is $1,800. So that's less than, well, less than you can rent anything. Wait, wait a minute. I want to make sure they heard that clearly. So if he was going to be buying a single family residence and living in it by himself, he would have qualified for 645,000 and his payment would have been 4,257. But yep. because he bought a triplex and the purchase price was 830,000, with the rental income on the other two units, you're telling me his monthly payment is eighteen hundred bucks. Yep, and that's 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 only using seventy five percent of the rental income. If we if, if there were no vacancies, you had awesome tenants, they lived there, you know, whatever, paid all their everything on time. You could use the full forty eight hundred. <clears throat> now your mortgage payment six hundred bucks. But he you own eight hundred and thirty thousand dollar triplex, and you're paying six hundred dollars plus you know, maintenance, because again, you own the home, so the dishwasher breaks down, things like that, you know, that's the landlord's uh, uh, job to cover. But assuming none of that, your payment would be 600 bucks a month, a car payment. So, so, so right now, he's living in one of them. He has the other two units rented out, and his total payment is 1800 bucks a month for yep. an $830,000 property. If he was to move out of his primary unit and rent it all out at that current rate, he'd have a $600 a month bill to own an $830,000 property. Yeah, or if, actually, if he moved out, uh, let's just say, you know, a year down the road, two years down the road, rented all three units, which is the bottom line. If you purchased a new home to live in, rented all three units, assuming no increase in rent. Um, he would break even if we did it at the, you know, included the 25% vacancy factor. Mm -hmm. And again, if you had full-time tenants, stayed for a long time, and, <clears throat> excuse me, all three units, you would actually net 1800 minus, you know, your, your standard maintenance, maintenance expenses. So now you own three units and you're actually making money on them. So you're getting the benefit of the property appreciation and you're getting 1800 bucks a month cash flow after a couple of years when you move out and you move another full-time renter in there without ever raising the rent from $2,400 a month. Well, and then, then again, what you could do after this, you know, uh, let's just say you, you, you live here for a year or two, you move out, you purchase a single family residence because that's ultimately what you wanted. Uh, well, you can either purchase a single family with, and you'll go into it with what they call an ADU or, you know, most people call it a guest house or, or something like that, or you can convert a garage or something like that. So now you have technically four units collecting rental income along with the single family that you're, you're living in. And oh, you you're, getting, the, you're, get, you're getting ahead of our slides here and I got to, I got to, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got to catch up with you. I get, I get excited. I get excited. <laughs> So, so you're right. So that, that was a real good case study on a local property here in Los Angeles. We closed this out in August. The client's happy. They're making their payments lower than what they anticipated. They're going to be making money off this every month in a couple of years. It's a great investment. Okay. Super great investment. What, what our client was able to do. So um, coming back to the types of properties, you have single family and multifamily homes. Um, obviously single families are a little bit different and let's talk about that. Okay. So we gave you the two options already for multifamily house hacking, you know, get long-term tenants, uh, like the case study that we had or vacation, you know, rental things like that. Well, when we're talking about a single family house, here's the different ones you can do. Okay. So if you just buy a single family residence, what we call an SFR, 
That's your house, your primary residence, guys. Here are your four options for house hacking a single family residence. Number one, get roommates. Get yourself some roommates who are gonna help you, you know, make the mortgage payment every month and that offsets your mortgage burden. That's an easy one to do. Now, if you don't want full-time housemates, maybe option number two for single family house hacking would work for you. You know that you can rent out rooms on Airbnb and other short-term rental properties. You guys know you can do that. You'd be able to do that if you bought a piece of property, had multiple rooms, you can list your room on Airbnb to help take off some of that burden from your monthly mortgage payment. Now, if you're going to be doing Airbnb, understand that every city has its own rules for Airbnb rentals, okay? So it's depending on the location on how many days out of the year you can rent it and what's the minimum rental on the Airbnb for rooms and space, et cetera. So... Single family residence house hacking option one is housemates. Number two is renting rooms on Airbnb. SFR house hacking option number three, okay. renting out space, storage space. How many single family residence houses, guys, have garages where you can rent out space almost like a U-Haul space or a, uh, a, a, you know, a storage locker type of deal? That will help you offset the burden there. It's very unconventional, but you can rent out a garage or maybe a room for storage space for other people. Again, that's helping you reduce the monthly mortgage burden that you have as a single family house owner. The next idea that you can utilize to house hack single family residents would be accepting foreign exchange students. So if you live near a university, UCLA, USC, uh, Cal State, uh, Los Angeles, um, Pom Cal Poly Pomona, we have uh, UCR, you have Cal State San Bernardino, Irvine, Cal State Fullerton. There's a lot of universities here in Southern California, and a lot of them do accept and receive foreign exchange students. Well, those foreign exchange students need a place to stay every semester, every trimester. Those are long-term renters for you, okay? They're going to be there for maybe a year or, or more, and then you can continuously filter them out, all right? So that's four different ways you can house hack a single family residence. And Aaron, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but before we get into the building of ADUs and all that stuff, okay, I want to make sure that they know the last three ways that they'd be able to house hack a single family house, a single family home. So here's something that you can do. And Aaron was talking about accessory dwelling units, okay? You can always build a guest house or some people call it a casita. In the business, it's, it's an ADU, accessory dwelling unit. And I know this, in the city of Los Angeles right now, they have 12 pre-approved ADU blueprints and floor plans where if your single family residence property has the land to build one out of these 12 ADUs on it, you're gonna be streamlined and fast-tracked through the Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety. They're gonna stamp your ADU permits within two weeks because they've already approved these floor plans. It's a quick and easy way to build a secondary unit or a guest house that you can rent out short-term or long-term for your house hacking strategy. You could also convert your garage into an apartment. You can convert your garage into a residential unit. And that's not very expensive. Oh. But you got to do it the right way and get all the permits, okay? It's really big. One last thing that people forget, and it's, you know, a little bit different here um, in Southern California. We're not the Midwest where you have a lot of people with basements, okay? Yeah. But there are some older houses here in Mid-City, in Long Beach, 
Hey, Jackie, thanks for that. There's a lot of ADUs in, in Long Beach, Jackie says. There's a lot of basements. And if there's no basement, you know, you can convert your attic into a residential unit. Again, the key thing is whenever you're adding a separate unit to a single family property, get the permits done right. Get it done right. Invest in the property the right way. It's going to help you build equity. It's going to help you keep all the paperwork on, you know, the, the up and up when it comes to rentals. And you don't want to mess with housing authority, okay, here in Southern California, because they are, they are vicious. They're completely on the tenant side. And if you don't have your permits right and you're renting an illegal unit out, as a homeowner, you're going to regret it. I promise you that. And the third great thing about adding a separate unit to a single family residence is, well, now you got an extra space. And maybe later on, multi-generational family, right? You know, you see a lot of people who maybe move their parents in with them at, at an elderly age, or maybe you have to move in with your kids at an elderly age and you have your own separate unit guest house that you can say, hey, I'm going to leave you this house, kids. But when I'm old and I can't really do a whole lot, when I'm retired, I would like to live in this back unit, okay? Kick the tenant out and let me live there. So maybe it's a security blanket for some people down the road. But yeah, those are the, yeah, right? Because you know what? Those senior housing places, they're really expensive, aren't they? Oh, yeah. They're super expensive. And if you do it right, adding an ADU is going to make you so much money. Cash flow equity. And then if you need a place to crash out and when you're retired, that's the spot. Okay. So Aaron, I know you were talking about this. I just wanted to make sure they were aware of these other ways they can use the house hacking strategy to benefit themselves. Okay. Yeah. That's really, that's really what I was going into is this same thing. Cause then you could have potentially your single family, the three units that you bought and now a fourth unit all generating, you know, revenue. So. Yeah. Yes, yes. So to, to house hack, guess what? You have to get a loan. Unless you're buying all cash, you have to get a loan. So Aaron, why don't you talk about some of the different financing options that are available so our listeners and our participants can utilize them and start house hacking? Uh, your, your three main programs out there are your conforming loans, your FHA loans, and your VA loans. The 203K, the home style, I mean, those those are both, well, FHA and Fannie Mae are conventional loans, conforming loans, uh, but those are more of your, your rehab or builder type of deals. So if you were going to build that ADU or build an additional unit or just fix up, you know, the existing unit, uh, that's what those programs are for. FHA being, yeah, F, so VA obviously is the, next slide, uh, I'm with yeah, you. Know that. Yeah, there you go. Oop. Yeah, so V, there you go. VA is obviously, if you're a veteran, I mean, that's the ultimate way to go, you know, zero down. Um, FHA is about the closest right behind that with three and a half percent down up to four units. Uh, VA is uh, zero down up to four units. Uh, there are different, you know, qualifying factors as far as the rental income. Um, and that's what we can go into, for instance, FHA uh requires that the property cash flows so what that means is on that particular triplex for instance uh, that that individual had to come in with uh, about i think it was about nine percent down because his mortgage payment was 5400 and 75 percent of the total rent uh were, were 5400 so he came in with a little extra cash to bring that payment in line um VA, uh, a little bit different with them. They want prior uh, rental history or management history, or uh, if you have six months reserves, so basically six mortgage payments in reserves, same thing, they'll allow you to use that 75% of the second, third, or fourth unit. Um, so this is going into the FHA multifamily. Uh, I mean, you can get into the credit score as little as, you know, as low as 600. Um, obviously, the interest rates fluctuate based on credit score. Um, your loan to value, which is just like it sounds, it's your loan versus your value or your purchase price, uh, three and a half percent down. Um, pretty much everything is ran automated anymore. 
you know, you would call me, we go over your income, your assets, your credit, your your debts, uh, your credit score, things like that. I plug it all in. It gets ran through what they call an AUS or an automated underwriting system. Um, and then uh, we can calculate, you know, from there, I can tell you, hey, here's what you can purchase. Um, it, it does fluctuate your purchase power, if you want, depending on if you get a two, three, or four unit. Because obviously, if you get a two unit, I've only got, you know, one unit worth of income to tack onto your income, three and four. So that, that uh, pre-approval purchase price will uh, vary depending on how many units and what the rental is. Uh, and that's where uh, Vic comes in. Uh, if you guys find a place, hey, I want to put in an offer, I'm going to ask right off, what are the rent? And then yeah. I, from there, I can calculate, yes, you can qualify, no, you can't. Uh, because, you know, if the rent's five grand at one place and two grand at another, obviously, you know, that gives me less income and less purchase power. Um, the highlighted piece is what I was talking about, uh, where it's the, the self-sufficiency test, <clears throat> where FHA requires that 75% of all of the unit's income is equal to or more than your mortgage payment. Gotcha. We're going to keep the uh, Q&A for the end, guys, because we got to get through this presentation, but we will uh, address all the questions that are coming in. Uh, thank you for that, Hector. The next one. All right move on from here all right and we'll kind of we'll just kind of flip through these um so so yeah Oop, there we go so the fha because like we're going over you know you can purchase multifamily as a first-time home buyer uh, fha does require it does not require you to be a first-time home buyer they do require it to be owner occupied uh, that's how you get in for that three and a half percent the lower fha rates which are always uh, lower than your conforming rates uh, or your conventional Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. Um, so that's what here, FHA rules require a minimum three and a half percent down, and that can even be a gift. So if mom, dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, if you don't have the cash, they can gift it to you. So one you thing I want to make sure, that, one thing I want to make sure they know is on Airbnbs, you can't, I'm sorry, with FHAs, you can't have an Airbnb operation with these, right? Right. Well, you could, yes, they don't, they don't allow the Airbnb. That's where it goes into here. No Airbnb operations are permitted with homes purchased with an FHA mortgage. Long-term tenants, of course. Yeah. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And then this, um, so this kind of goes into the, what they call the 203K. Uh, it's a rehab loan. It's the same FHA loan, uh, but it's a, it's a construction loan. And there's two different types. There's what they call the 203K streamline, which let's just say, for instance, you bought a single family residence, uh, you want to update the kitchen, the flooring, you know, paint windows, that kind of stuff, more your cosmetic, non-structural uh, type of things. You can finance up to $35,000 worth of repairs or upgrades into your loan amount. So let's say you found the house, instead of buying it for, I don't know, let's say 500,000, and then closing and then having to cop up 35 grand out of your pocket to make it the way you wanted, you can actually roll that into the loan as long as the value is now worth you know, 535 or whatever you put into it. So it's a way to walk into the house exactly the way you want it. And 203K rehab programs are great for multifamilies because, you know, generally as a landlord, you want to try to put the rental property on the market looking as best as possible, right? And you could use this rehab money to go in there and maybe give it a fresh coat of paint, update the flooring and any of the other items in the unit. So you maybe get a higher price when you put those units up on the rental market. And you can even purchase appliances. So this way, you know, you're financing, let's say, the thirty-five thousand for a couple hundred extra dollars a month, versus having to cop that up out of pocket to make it, you know, get that the higher rent amount that you're wanting. So, very and, and unique right program. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's a very unique program. If you guys are interested in rehabilitation loans uh, for older multifamily or single family properties, two or three K might be the way for you to go. There's, there's a whole lot here. And I think that, you know, with, with um, the, 
the time frame that we have today, I think this is something that maybe you can take offline, Aaron, for anybody who wants to talk about 203K rehabs for yeah. house hacking. Yeah. Yeah, this goes a little more into detail that we can go into, you know, if you have a property that wants to, you know, go that route. Uh, Fannie Mae has their version of the 203K. It's the Fannie Mae Home Style Renovation Loan. Um, pros and cons to both. Um, some of the pros to the home style, um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, um, is they'll allow, it's a one-time, what they call a one-time close. So you finance it, uh, you roll everything in, and you lock in your rate. Um, they don't have the $35,000 cap um, on this particular one. You can go to the next one. Um, so same thing. You can do it on a. You can even do these on a refinance. You know. So if you did buy a property and ended up wanting to refinance it, you can roll those rehab costs into it. Uh, same thing. Primary residence. They'll do these on second homes and investments. FHA will not. Uh, you can go to the next one, Vic. This is kind of gives you a quick breakdown. Uh, one unit, ninety-five percent LTV. In other words, five percent down. Uh, that's a primary resident. Two units, fifteen percent down. Three to four, twenty-five percent down. So you get into you know meat requiring a larger out-of-pocket uh, cost going this route than you would on FHA or VA. And these guys allow you to take uh, more than the thirty-five thousand than the streamline uh, two hundred right. Kalen, so you can rehab it and get these properties rent ready. Yeah, they'll let you add units, add an ADU that we had mentioned earlier, things like that. Oh, so with a home style loan, oh, that's something I, I learned right now. So with a home style loan, you're able to buy a single family residence. And with this home style loan, you can get an advance through the loan to build the ADU, the secondary unit out. Yeah, as long as it increases the value to cover the cost of the purchase plus whatever the rehab is. So if you bought it for 500, it costs you 50 grand to do a, an ADU, it needs to appraise at 550. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac actually just rolled out. Now they are allowing us to use uh, ADU rental income to help you qualify, whereas uh, six months ago they did not. Oh, wow. Yep. Good FHA to know. FHA does not do that. Good to know. How about VA guys? Well, VA, you know, being a veteran myself, I mean, it's just a, it, it's a phenomenal, it's just an awesome loan. Uh, I mean, you can walk in again, you know, if you've got the pre, you know, if you'd owned the manager property before, or even if your job is, let's say you're a property management or some type of uh, landlord type of deal, or you have six months worth of uh, your mortgage payment in reserves, you can go zero down on, on four units with a lower rate than on your conventional and still get the same rental income as you would on the other, you know, the conforming or the FHA uh, loans. And there's no PMI, what they call private mortgage insurance on the VA loans. It, it's just, it's, it, it's a phenomenal loan. But just like FHA, owner occupied only, they do not do investment properties. Mm -hmm. So this is where we get into the house hacking. You can buy an investment property because you're renting three units, but your owner occupying one. Yep. So, you got to be in at least one of those units. That and makes this, sense. this is breaks down. It's kind of what I was just talking about. Uh, if you've got a uh, you know, property management background, rental background, or six-month PITI, which is your total mortgage payment, uh, they allow you to use 75% of, uh, of the rents to help you qualify for that two, three, or four-unit property. Good to know. Good to know. I like it. Let's see here. We'll talk about VA. If, the, if you guys are VA qualified, then make sure you mention that when you talk to Aaron offline to get yourself pre-qualified for a mortgage and take advantage of our $1,000 closing cost credit that we're going to give you. Um, this briefly goes into the different arms for, you know, the, the seven different arm, armed forces that, you know, are allowed to get into VA. And same thing here, just like any home, you know, it's, it can't be a teardown. You know, VA doesn't do the rehab loans. Yeah, they, they got to be uh, really good in, in really good condition. Um, so, so ladies and gents, we talked about the nine different ways you guys can house hack, right? And we'll recap that um, right now. So, so with multifamily properties, you're able to 
house hack with long-term renters and the secondary, tertiary, or fourth units. You could also house hack multifamily properties um, by using vacation rentals, okay? Uh, you know, people who are going to be there for, you know, two, three, four months at a time, that could help you out with those particular units. When we're talking about single family houses, um, you have uh, four options there. You can get some roommates, okay? Get some housemates who are gonna help lift the burden off you. Uh, number four house hacking option, you could rent out rooms on Airbnb if your city requires it. But again, it can't be an FHA loan. Um, it has to be a conventional style loan. Um, you could also use the single family residence property to rent out storage space in your garage or maybe leverage your lot for storage. Or something that's very out of the box is if you live near a university, using the single family house to rent out rooms to foreign exchange students who are going to be, you know, basically rotating in and out through the house as the semesters and the years of their college goes by. Now, if we're talking about the last three ways to house hack, okay, number one is long-term renters for multifamily. Number two is vacation renters for multifamily. Number three is housemates or roommates for a single family. Number four is renting rooms out on Airbnb for that single family. Number five is renting out storage space on or in the property itself. Number six is foreign exchange students and Number seven, number eight, and number nine ways to house hack. It's all about adding a separate unit to the single family property. Whether you're adding a basement or an attic apartment, you're converting the garage into a rental unit. And the last one, from the ground up, building a brand new ADU guest house or casita, if you will, a grandmother suite in the back. Those are the nine different strategies you could utilize to house hack and get yourself in your first property or get yourself your very first investment home. So those are the nine ways and we just wanna real, make sure that you know them. Just real quick too, just wanted to make it clear that, uh, you know, the Airbnb, the storage, foreign exchange students, renting out your rooms, things like that. Those don't help you from a qualifying standpoint. Your long-term tenants in the units is where I can help, you know, get yeah, you into the yeah. units. Those are those are house hacks after you purchase, you know, the units, but they don't, uh, I can't add them in as, you know, additional income for you. I just right, know. right. So, so to qualify there. for, to qualify for that, to help all that rent help you qualify for a piece of property, the, the best way to house hack is to buy a multifamily. Yeah. The best way. Okay. Hands down, buying a multifamily property, duplex, triplex, or fourplex, they're the the expected rental income is going to help you qualify. If you're going to be using roommates or Airbnb rooms for exchange students, renting out storage space, or adding a basement or attic apartment, converting your garage, or building a guest house ADU, those are things you'd have to qualify for a single family residence on your own. And then after the fact, you'll see the benefit when they pay you rent relieving you of the burden. It just won't help you to qualify exactly. for the property, okay? So uh, I wanna make sure uh, we have a couple of minutes for Q&A, but before we get into q and just wanna remind you that our promo is going on. For anybody who is on this live cast or watching the recording, if you guys reach out to Aaron and get yourself pre-qualified, whether you qualify right now or not, if you just run the numbers, see what you qualify for, either single family residence or multifamily for house hacking purposes. If you do that in the next seven days before October 5th, we will give you a $1,000 closing cost credit that will be valid for the next 18 months, allowing you time to fix up that credit, save the down payment, get the time on the job that you need so we can utilize that $1,000 credit and help you purchase a piece of property that you can house hack, okay? So- and we're all coming real quick on that pre-approval too, Vic, is uh, assuming, let's say, assume that you don't qualify now, uh, been doing this so long that what I can do is I can put you on the path to qualify. So you may not qualify at the moment, but I can tell you, okay, hey, we need to do X with whatever income, job, credit, uh, you know, so over the next six months or 12 months or whatever it ends up being, then you would be able to qualify. 
so I can put you on that, you know, that right path. Yeah, I like that. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. We got 10 more minutes left in our house house hacking mm -hmm. webinar here. Um, seems like we have a couple of questions in our chat box. Let's see here. Um, Jackie, yes, a lot of ADUs, homeowners are doing this. Hector Duran, how do you deal with self-sufficiency on occupied units? That's not yeah. gonna be a question for me. Why, go away. Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, the uh, you know, what they're going to look at is uh, current rents or projected. So the same thing is if if you're buying a property and leaving it tenant occupied, then they're going to go with whatever your current rents are. Uh, so if if you're getting fifteen hundred bucks, let's say on uh, you got a fourplex and you're only getting fifteen hundred for the other three unit or for each unit, uh, that's what they're going to use. So if market is twenty two hundred. Well, then you may want to purchase that property vacant. Uh, one, from an income standpoint, you know, after you purchase it, but also from a qualifying standpoint. Uh, because when they do the self-sufficiency, they allow all units. So if you bought four units, uh, the self-sufficiency uses all four for that cash flow, whereas the qualifying piece only uses the other three that you're not living in. So... That's how they're going to do it. So even if you, from a buyer, if you know that the market, there's 700 under market on each unit, well, the best way to do that, and that's where Vic comes in, is to purchase it vacant, and that way you can rent it out at market. Mm -hmm. That's Vic's job. And I can help with that. Hector also has another question here. Um, so he has three questions here. So a second question for Hector is, can you use the ADU rental income to qualify on FHA and conventional, or is it limited in some way? It's only on conventional. Um, and that's actually just within, I would say, the last probably three or four months, uh, they started allowing that. And that's because of all the, the big ADU craze uh, because of the housing shortage and everything, and the fact that the state of California became very, very lax on uh, who can build ADU setbacks. I mean, all these different things, just about anybody can build them now. Uh, so, yes, can, on a conventional, they will allow a permitted ADU. Uh, we can use the income on that. FHA, VA does not. And, and key point is permitted. There are a ton of converted, illegally converted garages, which, yes, can you rent it out after the fact? Yeah. Can I use it for income? No. Uh, it's got to be a permitted ADU, which can be a garage or, you yeah. know, a back house, things like that. that that's what we're talking about. If you're going to be, you know, converting your garage, your basement or attic into a rental unit, get the permits, guys. Don't cut corners because it's not going to benefit you on your on your debt to income ratio. It's not going to benefit you uh, in regards to appreciation of the property. And if you are in a heavily um, looked at area like the city of Los Angeles, LA Housing Authority, they are the worst. And I don't care if they see this on the recording or not, but man, <laughs> they will just, they will throw the book at you if you're renting out anything that doesn't have the proper permit. So do it the right way. Make yourself uh, a lot more money that way, a better investment and relieve yourself of any future headaches. Okay. And a garage conversion is probably one of the easier because you don't have, you don't have to mess with the structural uh, it's already the roof. I mean, everything is done. Your foundation is there. I've got a friend of mine uh, out this way uh, converting her garage into a one bed, one bath uh, into the garage, and she'll get uh, 1800 bucks, which brings her total mortgage down to $1,100. Easy, easy yeah. breezy. Let's see. Hector asks, as a landlord, where can we find out some uh, information on renting rooms to foreign exchange students and what are the benefits? Okay, so Hector, um, there's a little thing called Google, I would go to Google and I would GTS, Google that stuff, okay? <laughs> every every university is going to have different uh, rules for their foreign exchange students, okay? And, and how much they're going to be able to pay if they're on the scholarship or, or whatnot. But the benefits are your foreign exchange students don't need a whole house. They generally want a room, just a bedroom. 
And that's where it's great to house hack single family residences with for exchange students, they need a room and access to a bathroom and access to a kitchen. It's not like they need a garage conversion or a whole ADU apartment. And you can have that single family residence, have them rent out the rooms. And if they're in a foreign exchange student, keep this in mind, here's the benefit. You know that they're going to be there making their grades and paying you. Okay. Especially if they're on scholarship, it's almost like section eight yeah. for universities. So there's the benefit. The, the rental income is basically guaranteed by the university once they're accepted as foreign exchange students. They have to showcase their ability to pay rent. If they're on a scholarship, they will get a stipend for that. And that's the benefit of a foreign exchange student. Google it though, and then find out what the rules are in the area near you. And Hector's last question here is, is there a 25% maintenance slash vacancy factor on yeah. using ADU income to qualify yes they, they always have that uh, on any on any rental it's 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 been the norm the 25 percent vacancy factor since i started back in 92 um and that's just you know the vacancy um or you know in maintenance you know hey uh ac breaks down you know the stove the dishwasher or you know somebody moves out you know things like that so they'll always does that mean that that's all you're going to make? No, but that's all I can use to qualify you. Very good. Um, any more questions? If you'd like to uh, type them in the chat box or unmute yourself. If not, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I thought this was a really good, yes, Hector. Hey, I just wanna say thank you guys so much for answering all those questions. I really appreciate all of that information I got. I gained lots of clarity here. So thank you again. No worries. Right. You got 50 years of experience sitting here. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. Thank you, Hector. And thank you, Bridget, for the session. Thank you to all of our um, participants today. This has been recorded. Uh, we did have several more people RSVP for this. We're going to email out the recording of this so you guys can revisit this as you see fit. And don't forget, if you or somebody that you know is looking to leverage these house hacking strategies, we have this seven day promo guys. If you contact Aaron Tennyson and start the pre-qualification process before or by October 5th, we're going to give you a $1,000 closing cost credit towards your house hacking purchase. And that credit is going to be good for 18 months from then. Okay. So it gives you plenty of time to get your down payment, your credit, or your employment history in order so you can buy a piece of property. And our contact information was at the end of that PowerPoint and it'll be in the recording. It'll be in the recording and the email, absolutely. Aaron, I wanna thank you so much for your expertise and your time wow. today. Thank you for participating and giving us all this great info. It's, it's really a hosting. pleasure. All right, guys, thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you soon. Take care. Have a good one.